Welcome to Tree Talking Time, where we talk all things tree dogs. From the smallest fights to the largest hounds, drink squirrels to bears and everything in between. And from time to time, we might even run a little fast game. The best dog that uh, I hunted more and understood more and everything was probably old Ruff. Yeah, and he was the sorriest reproducer that I ever had. <laughs> well, as far as since you said he was the best he, dog you ever had, what was a good hunt you had with Ruff? I just saw a yeah, picture of Ruff uh, being a bear. I was doing, yeah. I, was doing some I research. used him. I used to, I used to hunt for a living and I took him every day. Okay. People would come from everywhere to watch him fight a bobcat. Uh, he would be a bear, and uh, and he saved me a lot of times. A bear would be about to get me. He'd go in, uh, grab it by the rear end, and turn it around. I guess uh, about the funniest story I can remember, I was hunting an old boy that had a uh, Bow and arrow, and he was shot all of his arrows into the into the bear, and uh, the old bear just reached around and get him or spit him out. <clears throat> Handed that bow to his uncle. He had a little short uncle with him, and he hung it around his neck. And he had a camera. He was uh, taking a movie of all that. And the bear uh, he had that around his neck, and the bear come off of the hill and run right up his face. He didn't know how close he was looking to that camera, and he turned around and run. Got behind. Uh, hung between two trees. It was just a playing with him backwards and forth. That bow had him and uh, strung up. He was screaming. Oh, uh, the bear was right on him, and Ruff grabbed the bear and it sat down, and the, the bear's back was touching the man. <laughs> and he, he looked around, all he could see was fur. He looked like he was wearing a fur coat. That's funny. And uh, uh, well, then that guy. <laughs> Handed him the, the bow, had a pistol he was shooting it with. Finally, he got it killed, and that man called me everything, like I said, but a country gentleman. <laughs> and, I, and I had this lay down life. What's he mad at you for? He couldn't hit the bear with a bow very well, and then and then put the bow down to take a video. Well, that ain't your fault. Uh, no, but he, <laughs> I was just supposed to save him, I reckon. <laughs> Well, your dog did, so it's all right. Yeah, that story is, was in her yearbooks and somewhere floating around. I hadn't seen it in a lot of years, but that was a pretty good story, I thought. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, no, that's funny. So, well, let's introduce you since uh, after that. So, I'm here tonight with Robert Kemmer. Robert Kemmer is the founder of the Kemmerstock Mountain Cur, the Kemmerstock Breeders Association. How are you doing tonight, Robert? I'm doing great for old man. So, you know, you heard my last podcast with Daryl Fry, and your daughter actually sent me a message with your phone number. So that's how we got hooked up. What would you think of that last podcast? I liked it, and uh, glad to hear old Daryl's voice. He sounded just like he did 30 years ago, and <laughs> I, I was glad to hear him. Well, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I mean, I just called him out of the blue. I was curious about his dogs, so kind of sprung it on him. So I'm glad to... Uh, yeah. You liked it, and you thought it did your dog some justice, so we'll even give him a little bit more of a platform here tonight, and we'll let, we'll find out a little bit more about him. Okay. Um, uh, old Daryl's been a really big help to this breed of dogs, so he's known worldwide what a hunter he is. Oh, yeah. Like, I like to get my breed of dogs in people's hands like him. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, I've only raised a couple litters of puppies. And that's always my objective is to get them into the hands of people that are going to hunt them, and there's been a few that it's, like I said, I've only raised literally a couple of litters, and I'm giving puppies away to people that I know will hunt them. And my wife's like, "What are you doing? You got money wrapped up in all this." And I'm like, "Doesn't matter." I said, "I want them dogs hunted. That's what matters." Yeah, uh, there's. I tell everybody there's three things that'll make a dog or ruin a dog, and uh, a lot of people don't like that statement. And that's the handler, the handler, the handler. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> Because I know that I... They can make them or break them. Because that, that statement's been very true in my life. I've ruined a few. Yeah. So, when did you get started with these old mountain curves? I had the first one. I was just uh, just real young, way before even school age. Okay. Went to my uncle's on a Christmas and had a fit. He had a litter of pups. I had a fit for one. And, uh, <laughs> and I kept him about 14 years. 
Okay. And I was very sick at that age, had Bright's disease, and I don't know what all, and my parents let me bring him to the house, and I treat cats on the curtain with him. Got an early education. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we always had old cur dogs on the farm. Uh, they'd do anything we wanted them to do. They, when you let them run loose one on one, they get as smart as people. I've heard that. And honestly, I, I wish I could let the, my dogs run loose. I think a lot of guys do. Yeah, them days are gone. Uh, Unfortunately, for most of us, I kept them till till I went in the service, and I had three dogs, or my family did, running loose on the farm, and they got staying treat all the time. And people knew it, and they just went to tree and got them. Gotcha. And when I come back, I got the old rough dog. That's where I started with the registered. Okay. About cur dogs. Now, about what year was that? That was in 67. Okay. So is, is that when you started breeding your dogs? Yeah, I'd always raise pups and give them away and everything. Uh, but uh, I, shortly after that, I started uh, started breeding them uh, because I was a uh, hunt for a living and uh, had to have a lot of dogs. What were you hunting? We hunted a lot of a lot of wild boar, and you go out there and you get your pack cut up one day, and they're all tarred and sore and injured. You got to have some pressure for the next day. Okay, I can understand that. I've, I've went hog hunting one time, and it's funny they they had two packs of dogs. And first pack ended up on a bear, and we had to go back and get the second pack to run a hog with with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we always patched them up. We got one cut. We just run it to the vet, get it fixed, and uh, had their jugular veins cut and everything, and saved them. But wow, it's that's amazing impressive. how tough a dog is. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I've got a friend that's a vet, and uh, she bear hunts. Some of the stories of the bear dogs that she's patched up it's impressive what they can live through. Now, did you ever? Yeah. Now, did you ever hunt any other type of tree dogs besides mountain curs? Like I've always tribe. had uh, one or two. Uh, I had an old walker dog that I trained with old Ruff, and he hunted with, or hunted like a cur dog. I, that was the best of two worlds there, a cur and a hound together. Uh, that works works out pretty good. Cur will shorten a race. A lot of people say they cheat. They'll go in and run to catch. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, that's why they always have the old, that's why that old saying of, you want the fur hunter cur is around. Yeah, yeah, they'll uh, they'll stop about anything and uh, and and shorten the race. Uh, they they won't just follow along behind a boar or bear and, and and bark. They'll go in and and stop him, turn him around. Now, when you got started, you said you were you know hunting hogs. Uh, was that all you were hunting, or were you hunting anything else? Ah, uh, we were hunting bear and uh, bobcat and a uh, little of everything. Okay. And then I'd hunt all day and then pleasure hunt, coon hunt that night. Same dogs? No. Well, I have, uh, but most of the time I'd have different ones. Okay. Like the old rough dog, uh, I never did hog hunt him. And I was uh, coming out of the woods with a man and a bobcat one day, and he, he said, I'd like to kill a couple of hogs. And it was a pouring rain, like you poured it out of a bucket. I didn't want to go... 10 miles, get another dog. I seen the hogs cross the road, and I hissed old rough a little, and we killed two hogs from him in 30 minutes or more. Like Daryl said, versatility is why he liked the camera dogs. Yeah, yeah, you can teach them to do anything, or you can break them off of anything. Mm-hmm. So I have leopards now, but I had some mountain curs, and I had some tree and curs. Um, overall, I would say they were probably easier to break and easier to train. Yeah, they got a head full of sense. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I think that's what makes them uh, such a good winded dog. Uh, they got uh, a good nose on them. They got enough brains to use it. Nope, I, I would agree with that. I've, I've done my fair share of coon hunting with a, a pretty good mountain curve female back when I lived in Ohio. Uh, a lot of it was just the fact that she was she was smart. Yeah, Ohio used to be my best market uh, back in uh, about the eighties. Uh, coon hides are expensive up there. Mm-hmm. Oh, I bet. And I'd go to the Kent National swim race and uh, field trial. I've heard all kinds of stories about that place. People from everywhere grabbing my pups. Like I said, I've heard all kinds of stories about that place. Good and bad. That's all true. (laughs) (laughs) So um, when did you start 
the KSBA, which is the Kemmer Stock Breeders Association. September of 91. What was your reasoning for doing that? Well, just to tell you like it is, I had been in the original Mount Kerr for 18, 19 years, mm-hmm. and there was so much jealousy in there that I always tried to have the best and do the most and everything. There was so much jealousy. 90% of them hated me and everybody connected with me. Gotcha. And uh, Calvin Boutique started writing a uh, column uh, just to people that had my dogs. And uh, they had a column in Full Cry a long time before we ever had an organization. Okay. And the people that had my dogs is the ones that wanted to start it, and they said at that time, 85% of them in the computer was my bud line. Mm-hmm. And uh, they just wanted to get away from that. Gotcha. Uh, see, uh, we had an old gentleman that uh, done the papers with a typewriter back then. <laughs> and uh, it got too big. And I raffled off a pup. And they brought $2,250, and it was a full brother to uh, Gold Nugget JR okay. out of Gold Nugget and Bondi 3. And uh, we put that down on a computer, and, and then other people got to helping me, and we bought the computer and everything, and hired a girl up in Wisconsin to type it in, and... Uh, and started uh, on a computer. There you go. You that early dog's pioneers. name was Old Prize. Uh-huh. You said you were early pioneers and you know, computerizing it and everything. Yeah, we had a man up there that was real good with them. And of course, we used him like a barred mule. And uh, he'd come down here in his station where he could get it full of paper and go up there and type it back in. It took a long time. But it's a lot quicker now. Yeah. Ain't no tell how many is in there now. So you mentioned a couple of dogs just right in that statement, and plus when you were telling the story of Old Rough, a couple of the big names that you've you've had through the years. Why don't you tell us about a couple of your, you know, real notable dogs that you've line bred on that have made a, a big impact in the breed? Well, we will start with old Tennessee Mountain Blondie. I think she was the greatest street producer in the dirt dog world that's ever been. And we're working on that bloodline today. I've got a good friend in uh, North Carolina that uh, had a terrible car wreck about 11 years ago or 12 and put him out of commission but he had a lot of old dogs and every one of them was 50% Tennessee Mountain Blondie. Okay. And he still got them today. His name is Ben Lawless. And I'm going to give him credit for saving the second round of the Blondie Blood. Because they just about was all gone. And he had saved them. And we've been working on them. And got a got a litter that's right now uh, coming a year old. And uh, he, he has saved them, looks like. Wow. Awesome. We found one female. He had a bunch of males, and he, we found one female. Uh, our buddies up in uh, Virginia and Kentucky and their owned one, and we got her and brought her down there and bred her to Ben's dog. And the day the pups was five weeks old, she ate a plastic water bucket and died. Oh, that's a terrible loss. And if anybody got one that's, 50% Tennessee Mountain Blondie. I'd like to see them bred one of Ben's dogs. Like you said, I mean, I'm sure there's not too many of them still left around unless someone's been very intentional, especially that you don't know about. Yeah, see, she never was three quartered or nothing. Okay. Back then, inbreeding wasn't all that popular, and uh, I never did three quarter her as a bad mistake. But so 50% is the best we could get if she was alive. Yeah. And then, of course, she was a um, uh, mother of Gold Nugget and Blondie, too. That was two of her favorites. And Daryl's dog, uh, Stryker, was out of that pair, out of two litter mates. I didn't realize they were litter mates. And then they had another brother, was Yellow Bob, and he was bred to Blondie, too, his litter mate. Uh, Daryl had some of them out there. 
I need to get with him someday. Uh, I see if there's one anywhere in that country. Him and his brother had a lot of dogs out there because they hunted hard on big game, and uh, they may be one hiding in somebody's yard out there that we'd like to breed to. Yeah, he he told me he just had a litter out of out of striker semen. Yeah, the female is heavy striker bred female, like a you know a multi generation line bred female that was like a striker granddaughter multiple times or something like that so while maybe not 50 yeah. percent blondie blood it would be fairly close by the sounds of it. i'll tell you what would work and uh and i hope uh daryl gets as excited about it as me and uh ben lawless <laughs> them straws he's got mm-hmm. bred to one of uh lawless's young females mm-hmm. we, we would have it forever yeah, no, definitely. I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. There's a they, they was a lot of them out here one time. The the Kimmer dogs and our old target, you know, uh, yeah. buddy of mine took him and uh, tuned him up, and promoted him, and took him to the world hunt in a, in a blizzard in Indiana. There's way over a hundred dogs there, and, and he won that in, in a blizzard. Wow. As Rodney Smith, he's a, he's a good a dog man to ever been. Now, is he from where you, like, roughly close to you, or? No, he was, uh, he's in Kentucky now. Gotcha. Uh, I just wasn't sure what, a, if that dog was even used to hunting in snow. I know a lot of Kemmers, you know, are, are, are dispersed throughout the South, so I wasn't sure if the dog was from the South or not. Well, he, I sent him to Canada a little while, and okay. uh, he, he was used to it, but I didn't bother them. They'd hunt anywhere. To show you an example, uh, Daryl come here one time with old Stryker, and we drawed out together with uh, Target, the world champion, and Stryker. I don't think Stryker had ever seen a coon in his life, <laughs> and he just fell in there and looked like an old pro. That's awesome. Now, through the years that you've been breeding these cameras, have you focused on, on breeding for coon dogs, for hog dogs, for squirrel dogs? I mean, was there any sort of focus for that, or or were you just hunting a little bit of everything? Or We have found out that they're all double cousins, and uh, they will do anything you ask them to. People ask me all the time, if you know where I can get a, a pup that's bred for hogs, or bred for coon, or bred for squirrel, They'll do anything that you show them. Now, what uh, a squirrel dog will do, these dogs can tree a squirrel, wind a squirrel, and tree it further than your shotgun can kill it. And if you want a squirrel dog, the, the squirrel will always be there. These dogs will wind them and just take you straight to the tree. They don't have to walk the logs and smell every stump and sift the sand and all that. They just wind them. Yeah. And they tree coon the same way. I've seen them, if a wind was blowing, would tree a coon several hundred yards. And if you'll just stop and shine, you'll see the coon's eye. Nice. And uh, the people don't believe that. I tell them that. And they say, that dog's tree in the side. See, that old man don't know what he's talking about. I know something you else have been working on for a little while are the, the hybrids where you cross them with feist. When did you start doing that? Well, always done it all my life, but I never did call them that till I don't know, 20 years ago or more. Okay. Uh, people got to want them squirrel dogs or a smaller dog, you know, that they can um, ride in the cab of their truck and go hunting or keep them in the house and turn them out and they'll go tree something. Uh, a lot of people just like a smaller dog, mm-hmm. and we've been doing it for years, and uh, They've got all the uh, all the qualities of the uh, Kimmer curves, just maybe in a smaller portion. Okay, gotcha. I sold one uh, two or three weeks ago, and a day or two before he was eight weeks old, a man tracked up a wounded deer and sent me a picture of him standing on that deer. Dang, start young, that's for sure. Yeah, they're just programmed to, to track something. Mm-hmm. Are you still raising and breeding both curs and hybrids then? or? Yeah, we've got two litters of uh, nice little hybrids here now. I've got an old cur female. Uh, it's going to happen any time. She looks like she's going to have 12 or 15. 
Nice. Hopefully she has a nice big litter for you and she raises them all. Yeah. I read, I was doing a little bit of research before we got to talking here tonight, and I, I stumbled across uh, somebody's website, and uh, they had your uh, rules for breeding, and I found them kind of interesting. Would you care to go through them and tell us a little bit about them? Well, uh, yeah, I'm- I don't know that it's anything special. Just uh, you gotta gotta make you, you know, these cur dogs. You gotta make them love you to start with. You get a pup. I tell them to put it in their pocket, take it with them everywhere they go. And a lot of people think I'm a little nutty, but it works. <laughs> hey, if, if it's worked for you for the, all these years, I'm sure it's proofs in the pudding, and you're con- producing some dogs, some good dogs. So, yeah. If you want to ruin one, put it in a pen with a stuff feeder, and you'll buy about once a week, throw some feet in that feeder, and not have it. You've got your cull. If you'll make it your best friend and ride it around your truck, let the kid pull the hair off of it, it'll, it'll be the best buddy you ever had. What else do you look for when you're breeding dogs? I just, uh, I gotta have a lot of grit and a lot of, a lot of go, go power or go yonder. And, uh, uh, super nose. You gotta have a good nose. Well, you saying that kind of goes against what a lot of common thoughts are on curs. Pretty much a lot of people think cur dogs are hot nose, close hunting dogs. You're saying you want a lot of nose and a lot of hunt. Yeah. So, sorry to we're gonna stop you in the middle of your breed rules here, but what kind of dogs are you, uh, what, what style of dog do you like then? Like as far as hunt and nose, like what do you expect out of a dog? Uh, well, I expect them to have a nose good enough that they can tree a squirrel or a coon on top of a tree and, uh, before they ever get to the tree. Okay. And if there's a little bit of breeze blowing, they will to stand up in the middle of the field out there on their back feet and walk around like something crazy, uh, trying to get a little taller to see where, uh, which way that breeze is coming from. Yeah. And then they, they go tree it. And a lot of people uh, have never, never seen that in their life, a, a dog uh, that can and would do that. Yeah. Now, like, how far out do your dogs hunt, typically? Uh, most of the time, they just hunt hard in a half circle around you or something out in front of you. Okay. A um, hundred yards is a long ways in the woods. But then if they uh, smell something there, they go wherever they have to to catch you. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was just curious. And catch, that's a, that's the a name of the game. They they run to catch. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of people think they cheat and uh, everything. They'll, uh, when they smell it, they'll drift and circle and do whatever they got to do to pick up the hot end and leave out. Now, your dogs tend to be silent on track or open? they very few of them are completely open, but if they get excited, they'll they'll open here and there, and you'll know which way they went. Okay. Well, I guess we could go back to your uh, rules of breeding now that I interrupted you. Most of all, you got to have grit. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I've had a litter of pups of six or eight weeks old. You show them a cage coon or something, they just pile all over that cage and try to tear it out. It seems like they're just programmed. They'd rather have a coon as anything. Okay. So they got a nose, they got grit, and we never had no trouble with them a hunting. They'll go a hunting. Now, with all that grit, you have a lot of problems with dogs being too gritty, getting killed, starting fights, anything like that? You mean fights with other dogs? Yeah. No, they're not uh, not gritty in that way. I've heard of other breeds and stuff where, where when grit's been a focus, it eventually kind of crosses that line to where sometimes a little too much grit equals dog aggression, where a little too much grit equals a suicidal dog on a on a bear or on a boar or on a lion, something like that, especially, especially on big game. It's not really something that happens with coon hunting as much. But. Well, they've got to have brains, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people that's got hog dogs don't like my dog because uh, I always wanted one to stop the hog by grabbing him in a dead run in the rear end and spin him around, and when the hog stops, they're on the other side of him. Okay. And... Uh, I don't want them to go in and get them by the ear, and uh, they get them by the ear and stand out in front of them, that hog. All he got to do is just stand there and cut their guts out. 
Mm-hmm. But if they'll stop it and be on the other side when the hog stops, I was going in and getting them caught. Now, that's to me, that's the bulldog's job. Yeah. And these dogs don't do that well because uh, they just be all over their head if they even tried it and, and they wouldn't live long. Okay. But uh, I've never wanted a, a, a catch dog in these dogs. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And as far as aggressive towards other dogs and everything, what makes an old male dog uh, aggressive is uh, if you got two or three males and you're breeding one and not the others and everything, they develop a, a hate for them others. Hmm. You got to watch how you handle them at home. Interesting. Never heard that. But that if you sense. put them in a kennel next to one another, you know, like with a war between them, they might just. Uh, our hole and get a hold of the other because of something he done he, he developed a hate for. I've seen that happen with some. They're just dogs. like humans, huh? I said I've seen that happen. Actually, a, a father and a buddy of mine had a father and son had been living in pens next to each other their entire lives, and then the dad was nine or ten years old, and the son was like six. And all of a sudden, one day, those two decided they hated each other, tried to kill each other. Yeah. Through the pen. And- yeah. Yeah, they'll do it even across the yard. They'll see one another over there. Someday, one or the other of them will break a chain or however you keep them. Mm-hmm. If you're uh, breeding one, not breeding the other or something, they, they develop a jealousy. So what else are you looking for when you're breeding dogs? What else? Anything else? Or am I, that about it? Well, I, I want them with a handle on them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want them to come and check in with me every little bit. If they're not on a track, I want them to come and see about me. Okay. And I've had them more than more than a dozen. If you, I like to used to like to walk old log roads in the woods, and eventually that road will fork. And I've seen them dogs come back and stand at that fork to see which way which fork I was going to take. Okay. And then they would go go that way hunt. And uh, then they go in a straight line, and you have to look for them. I never had a tracking collar, and uh, if you lose your dog every time you take them or something, I don't don't want them dogs. Mm -hmm. They got to have brains. I think that's common with a lot of guys that run cur dogs. They that's what they they like the allure of a cur dog over a hound is is the handle and the brains. Most guys that I've talked to, most of what I've read. Yeah. I would say I'm a, I'm kind of in that boat. That's why I run leopards. I float that middle ground. They're kind of a cur dog. Yeah. Even though the UKC says they're hounds. <laughs> uh, I, and I guess in the dictionary or wherever they describe a cur dog as being a mutt or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe 200 years ago, a cur dog might have been from a farm shepherd that herded the cows and an old bulldog that... Uh, that caught the hogs, and that's where they got the hot nose and the ill temper and uh, and everything. But these are different all together. They've been bred for a hundred years to to be hunters. Yep. There's a book out that's called Cumberland County's First Hundred Years. Okay. People used to go from. Uh, the east or to west, and they'd cross through here, and they'd tie a tree to their wagon and go down them hills. The tree would hold them back. Well, one family had a terrible wagon wreck here in Grassy Cove and killed their mule to all but one, and they had to settle here, and their uh, offspring is still here, friends of mine. Okay. And uh, they're uh, Fords, and they got here about three years before the Kimmers. And uh, anyway, they had to settle here in this valley with a pair of brindle bobtail dogs. And one of them's name was Dinwiddie, after the governor of Virginia. And them dogs, uh, the brindle color, produced both black and yellow and brindle. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the same old dogs are still here. Yep. So you, you mentioned the color. Most Kemmers that I see are yellow, but you do occasionally see brindle and black. Is there any other colors that you, are out there as far as Kemmers? No, not in my breed. Okay. There, uh, there used to be some blue ones. You know, our war hero, Sergeant York's family, brought some blue ones in this uh, country. Uh Back when he come home from the war, I guess, and uh, and 
the blue ones uh, produce the chocolate, and uh, well, I don't have any of that. Uh, it's in the original mountain cur. Mm-hmm. I've hunted but, with a uh, fair amount of mountain curs. I've only ever hunted with one camera. And uh, he was, I was actually looking to buy the dog. He was uh, owned by a dog trader, basically. A guy who had owned him prior passed away. And so the trader that owned him didn't really know much about him. He had some some issues that I chose not to take on, (laughs) which I'm not saying it was the dog. Like you said, I'm sure handler was the, was the main issue that created those issues. So that's the only camera I've ever hunted. So, but I've hunted with quite a few mountain curs and so very familiar with the breed and I've hunted with Quite a few blue ones, actually. Uh, blue ones, uh, mountain cur or leopards? Yeah. Mountain curs. Yeah. Buddy of mine in Kentucky, Dave Glazebrook, uh, he liked the blue ones, and he's like me. He's getting too old to have a lot of dogs now, but he specialized in them blue ones for, for years. And, okay. And uh, there's still a few around. Mm-hmm. But talking about the uh, leopard curs, uh, you may or may not know this. There was some leopard uh, leopard breeder. I had my old target dog up in uh, Canada mm-hmm. uh, being hunted, and uh, they would take leopard dogs to Canada and breed to them. And some of them would come uh, reddish, dark yellow. Yep. And they actually started a new breed with them, called them Camus Curs. Oh, I thought I thought those were the Canadian Curs up there that got started with Camus Cross the Leopards. They did. They uh, they bred him to everything up there. That's what started the Canadian Curs. Yeah, because I I read a, and the Camus a big history on the Canadian Cur, and I mean, I think the first two dogs was actually like you kind of said it was uh, it was a border collie and a and a German short hair. They bred those two together. Then they lined, or they like inbred those pups, culled really hard. And then when they started out crossing, they started out crossing Kemmers and Leopards, if I remember correctly. I, but I saw some pictures of some of those Canadian curs, and they are exactly what you're saying. They were like a brownish leopard color. There was a man passed through here one night, and he uh, called me and asked me if I had a dog named Target. I told him I did, and I finally wanted to know why he was asking all these questions. And he said, well, I just bought me a dog and went and tried him out. He had the best nose I ever seen on a dog. And I asked the breeder where that nose come from. He said it come out of that old uh, Target dog of Kippers. Okay. And... Uh, you know, I ain't going to say a whole lot more because the gentleman's dead, but they kept the road out of breeding, running dogs from South Carolina to Canada. Gotcha. So what's the future look like for the KSBA? What's the future? Mm-hmm. I wish I knew. I mean, I'm saying like when when, when you pass away, is the KSA, KSBA going to close up shop or do you think it'll keep on rolling? And- it's going to close up shop. There's not enough uh, enough hunters and interested people anymore that care about keeping them pure. Gotcha. And the uh, biggest mistake I ever made was having a KSBA. Why do you say that? Well, see, when they were going to break off from the uh, Ridgeville Mountain Curve, we started, uh, I started to set up my own register and... Uh, and register them everything because I just had enough of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a Toyota pickup full of papers. And the day that we had a, a get together here, and I was going to start registering them. My daughter was going to register them and everything. And some of the people that had the dog said, We'd like to buy you out and have association. And we got to have the register. And all of that, so I give in. Well, we were going to be good old boys, and we let the original Mountain Cur, some of them in, because uh, they were having a lot of problems, and they wanted some place to register theirs, and we let them in. Mm -hmm. And then we had to start getting them out, because they brought walkers with their tails cut off, half bulldogs, Weimaraners, and everything, and they didn't want a breed club. My idea was to keep them bred pure and everything, and they wanted a hunt club. Okay. You know, 
They'll do anything in the world. A lot of people now, I'm not talking about everybody, a lot of people will do anything to get a $3 trophy so they can sell more pups. Gotcha. And they just made a mess out of it in a hurry. I think there's still quite a bit of infighting over there, over that same issue. From the outside. Over in the, or the original? <laughs> yeah, just from the outside looking in. Yeah, they, uh, they all hate me over there, and they wouldn't... Uh, they wouldn't five people in that whole club know me if I walked in the clubhouse because I've not been there in 30 years. But they've heard from the old timers uh, how what a sorry rascal I am. <laughs> gotcha. So if you could do it over again, what would you do? I would uh, set me up a register and register them and keep them pure and know what went in them. And if people wanted them, they could uh, get them, and then they could go register them in KC, UKC, wherever. But I wouldn't let no junk in them. Gotcha. I made a lot of enemies. With, uh, I made a lot of my friends mad at me because, uh, you know, they buy a pup in good faith and uh, and find out someday that it's not the real thing. And I, and no matter what I do, see, but there's always been two sides. Mm-hmm. And damn for do and damn for don't. I'm going to be a bad guy either way. Yeah. And I'm just trying to keep my mouth shut and let the board of directors and everything handle it because I can tell them I've been fighting this junk since 73. Yeah. Speaking of uh, the original Mount Curry, I got to tell you this story. You know, you probably heard of the 7 H Gold Nuggets. No, I can't say I have. We kept breeding, inbreeding. Inbreed gold nugget right on down to his daughters till we got them up to seven eights. There never was but two females bred out of gold nugget himself. We had a lot of seven eights gold nuggets with seven eights bred to seven eights and all that, but he never mm-hmm. produced but two females. <laughs> and I had one here I thought was the grandest thing since sliced bread. Rodney Smith had just won that big world hunt with Target. Mm-hmm. He come down here, and me and him and uh, two or three more went down to my kennel, and that female was in there, and we said, now we're going to breed her tomorrow to Target. I went down there the next morning, took old Target down there and breed that female, and there was five gates and doors open, and she was gone. And somebody went in there that night and got her. And it took me ten and a half years to figure out who it was. An old boy that used to come to my house every weekend, and I'd pretty much let him have whatever he wanted. He wanted the female to breed to his neighbor's dog. I was going to get him one, but I wasn't going to give him that one. Yeah, and uh, she disappeared. Bred her to his neighbor's big old brindle dog. Raised some fine pups. But she ended up with phony original Mountain Curve papers on her. And the blood is still in there today. Crazy. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to explain a little bit more about these cameras to me. Um, like I said, I, other than talking to Daryl, I really didn't know too much about them. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me tonight. Well, uh, it, it couldn't exist or wouldn't have existed all these years without people like Daryl and Bill, his brother, and all their boys and, and uh, old Rodney Smith and them people that uh, promoted them and uh, everything. And uh, now Calvin, he's raising some of this bloodline and he's uh, uh, caging squirrel dogs and and they just, a lot of people are helping. Mm-hmm. It's stuff I couldn't do all by myself, but I want you to keep an eye on Ben Lawless. He goes by Zane Lawson on the Facebook. But now he's going to be the savior of the luck, I say, the, the second round of these curves. Gotcha. Well, I'll definitely, I'll definitely keep an eye out. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Tree Talking Media. Until next time, keep them talking in the timber.